It's Black Friday, biggest sale of the year. Actually, right now, every single MAPS workout program, every single bundle, everything, 60% off. If you go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code Black Friday, you get 60% off everything, all of it. It's crazy. We only do this once a year, so head over there. Also, I'm going to give away a free program right now on this show. So one of you lucky viewers will get free access to MAPS Performance. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. You got to do all three of those things. If we pick your comment, because we like your comment, if we say, hey, you're the winner, you get free access to MAPS Performance. Isn't that great? All right, here comes an awesome show. You know, there was a Stanford study that uh, I've quoted many times on the show that talked about how having poor relationships in your life is as bad for your health as smoking something like a pack of cigarettes a day. And this really highlights something, and that is that health is a sphere that encompasses more than just your physical fitness and eating the perfect diet. It's a lot of things. It's almost everything. And if you understand that, balance really becomes much more natural and does contribute to your health in a good way. If you were to unpack that, would you say um, that's – all stress related or what is it about the poor relationships or the lack thereof that is more detrimental to us than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day? Is it all you think related to stress? Yeah, I, I would say it's gotta be a big component. Yeah, I would say that and not just that, but um, let's go on the opposite, right? Think of the value that good relationships bring your life, right? So you're having a challenging time there are people in your life that you could talk to that will be honest to you, that support you, right? If you have bad relationships, you don't have that. You don't have that person or those people to talk to. Or even if you have a success, you get promoted. Mm. I don't know about you guys, but when when I'm able to achieve things, it's not really that exciting until I can share it with the people around me um, that I really care about, that really support me. So I think it's a lot of different things, but it does highlight. And the reason why I like that study is because, I mean, how many people do you guys know that are fitness fanatics, that are so obsessed with eating perfect and exercising that they miss so many opportunities to build good relationships. They don't go to birthday parties, they don't go on vacations, or only only vacations where they can eat perfect and work out. They don't you know, go to the kid's game because that's leg day, or I don't go to dinner at my in-law's house because I have to eat the perfect meal or whatever. You know, I knew a lot of people like that in the sp in, in fitness, and it's it's you're you're not doing yourself any favors. If anything, you're you're hurting yourself. I think we see the same thing with uh, actors and actresses and athletes that uh, are great or very very talented in one area that they just ne tend to neglect other parts of their life. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's much different. If you got somebody who has this amazing body and they keep it at five percent body year round, and they're social media sensation with millions of followers and everybody's aspiring to be like them. They're posting and putting out just the best version themselves always. And so you just have no idea how out of balance and how potentially unhealthy this beautiful, perfect body looks. You know, you, you see this body and that's just one aspect of, of health. And there's many other aspects to it that we can't see in a glimpse like that. And I think it's more often than not, when someone is that extreme, when they're that extremely fit, when they train that all the time and that consistent, many times other things are out of whack. They, they sacrifice other parts of their life that are part of the health sphere. Yeah, I was, I'm thinking of this one study I know that um, uh, dealt with, with chimpanzees and um, they were evaluating basically the, the chimpanzee that was at the top that had would acquire all the food, all the, the girl chimpanzees, you know, sort of had uh, more opportunities to be in the parasympathetic state versus the other chimpanzees that were just constantly not getting their basic needs met. And they're just stressed all the time and having and fighting each other uh, in, in sort of this hierarchical kind of system. Uh, where they, they didn't live as long as the one that had, you know, sort of their basic needs met. If that's somewhat related to like having bad relationships, carrying that with you all the time, being in this sort of uh, sympathetic state of like, I got to fight or flight constantly, you know, that may sort of put, you know, that added bit of, uh, you know, harm to your body. Now, where, where do you think you guys, okay, obviously we're fitness fanatics, right? So the, like, uh, neglecting that part of our lives is probably been less uh, than other aspects. So when you look at the total sphere of health and all the other aspects that make up that bucket, 
Um, what would you say personally um, in your life that, that you tend to neglect or that you were maybe maybe you've solved that now that we're in our 40s, but maybe in your 20s and early 30s, you were still trying to work on this. Like what other aspects of health do you think maybe that maybe you weren't thinking of it as health back then? Um, that you might have been out of balance a little bit, but you obviously were good at training and exercising, staying consistent with that. What would you guys say is your your area of neglect in the, the oh, health I, sphere? I, I learned that lesson the hard way, didn't I? I mean, I, I, I overtrained and over dieted and took, you know, crazy things and always constantly pushing that. And uh, my body eventually rebelled and I had no choice but to to face the music. Now, I'm, I'm lucky that the my body rebelled in a way that I was able to somewhat recover, but, um, it did. And I was forced and, and obviously looking back, there were a lot of signs and signals that I had completely ignored. And I think the key really is, you know, if you're training for a, an event and you're a highly competitive athlete, of course, there's, there's a different application of consistency and, you know, sacrifices. But if this is a lifelong pursuit for you, you have to, you're going to have to find a way to incorporate balance into your life. Otherwise it'll become a stress. Otherwise mm -hmm. your diet is a stress. Your training is a stress. So, and, and what does balance look like? It, it balance is probably most of the time you're consistent. Probably most of the time you eat healthy, but there's those times when you go out to dinner with your spouse and there's those times when you miss a few workouts. It's not that big of a deal because you're on a vacation and there's other things that are more important. So I, that's really what I think this communicates to. Now, if you want to achieve a certain epic level of performance, you're going to have to sacrifice certain things. But the average person, the average person watching this is probably thinking, I want to do this forever. Like I want to have a lifelong pursuit of this. And I tell you what, you push that limit too hard for too long. At some point, like what would happen to me, your body's going to rebel and then you're getting nothing. You, you have none of the performance and you have none of the balance. And now you're dealing with some big problems. Well, I think similarly, uh, something that I had to learn later on too, is the importance of sleep and recovery uh, in the whole sphere of, of progress and moving forward and, and, and enhancing uh, what I was doing in the gym. Uh, because of, you know, that young mind and thinking that I could take it all on, I could get up and, and go to work and just, um, make do with just living off caffeine and, mm -hmm. and just trying to keep running, 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 uh, you know, as hard and as, as fast as I could. Um, but once I started to learn, like I had to be more intentional with, uh, being able to get quality sleep and, and, and be more focused on that to then help actually improve my performance in the gym when I'd go to work out and also uh, not just stay where I was. I was constantly sort of in the same kind of maintenance uh, progress and I just couldn't move forward because that wasn't a component. Yeah. How about you, Adam? You know, I, I struggled a lot with the the work life or money balance with how fit and healthy I would be. In other words, uh, I it was used like to, one or the other. Yeah, I used to say that a lot, right? I used to tell people, uh, like if I hadn't seen somebody in a long time and uh, let's say I was in really good shape, I'd say, well, what, you could always count on me. Uh, you could know, you could probably get a good guess at where my bank account is based off of how my body looked. So if I looked incredible and in great shape, uh, finances were a little tighter. Uh, if I was out of shape at that time, then you knew I was probably crushing it financially. Mm -hmm. Like I always had, because we're, I've always, uh, controlled my paycheck. You know, even when I worked for a company like 24 hour fitness, much of that I could control like with my bonuses and overrides. Cause I had a very baseline salary, but then a lot of the money that I made was dictated by how much I worked and effort that I put forth. And I always had a really hard time, uh, balancing that. I would just, I was, I I'm really good at getting tunnel vision on goals. Like, okay, this is what I need to do. And then forget everything else yeah. and just be good at this. Yep. Um, and then you come to a point in your life where, uh, what happens is you, you hit that goal and you realize you're unhappy because these other ones have fallen to the wayside. And then you go to this direction, hit that goal. And then this one fell off. And so I like to think that uh, where I'm at in my life now, I, I have finally pieced all of this together, like as far as having that. And I think that's just it is having this self-awareness to know. I don't think there's anything wrong with having specific goals that are going to require um, additional attention towards them, knowing that you know something's got to give and they're going to be a little bit of balance. But having enough of the self-awareness to know that, oh, wow, it's been this long since I've addressed this or uh, given this attention. And you know, Katrina and I talk about that with our relationship. We're, we're pretty good about 
knowing that, hey, it's been uh, a couple weeks since we've reconnected ourselves or done that dinner or date night. Like yeah. I'm, I used to be really bad with that, right? Like if I was super focused on work or physique, then relationship, I wasn't so good. And I think it's just uh, having a, a check-in. And this is why things like um, gratitude journals and affirmation and like meditation, this is where I think there's tremendous value is that is just that giving yourself that time and space to have no distractions so you can truly evaluate. It's that 10,000 foot view. Yeah. Give you, evaluate your goals and make sure that your goals, your life is, is aligning with the things that mm -hmm. you want from it. And many times just that check-in uh, itself will help you balance out the other yeah, aspects. I was, just, I was just talking to my buddy yesterday. He actually came to visit and he hadn't, he hadn't been in our studio and I'm showing around and he's really into working out and stuff. And he afterwards, he sends me a text and he's like, man, he goes, I'm working out and I feel so good in the afternoon. He goes, I, I normally work out early in the morning, 6 a.m., but he goes, but now I'm working out at two. And he goes, I'm way stronger and better performance. He goes, is this normal? I said, oh, yeah. It's, most people, and the studies will show, will perform better sometime in the afternoon and early morning workouts, you, you drop performance. I said, that's totally true for me as well. I get better pumps. I'm stronger. I get better results if I work out like around one o'clock. And he goes, well, why don't you just work out? At one, you own your own business. Like, why don't you make the time and do that? And I said, well, it's, it, to be honest with you, the other values now, and this, I can say this now, it wasn't like this when I was younger, but the other values I get from my workout is more important. Like the values I get from working out before we podcast, right? It puts me in a really good space. I'm sharper. I'm faster. I feel energized. The, the fact that it sets my day up and it puts me in a good mood. Uh, the fact that it's, uh, you know, it's the first thing I do. So when I start with something hard, everything else feels kind of easy the physical results I get from, I still enjoy, but that's not the number one goal like it used to be. Now it's more other stuff. So it's it's more balanced in that sense. Whereas in the past, I would organize my schedule around the perfect time to work out because it was all about my performance. It's not like that uh, anymore. And you know what's funny is that I have more longevity now with it. It's going to be something that, you know, it's part of the pro the evolution of doing something lifelong. If you don't have balance in something or balance with your life, Either you become obsessive and orthorexic or, you know, along those lines, which is unhealthy, or you drop off and you end up saying, I can't do this. I have to do that. And then you're unbalanced in that direction. But if you find ways to improve the quality of your life overall, like, you know, another example would be tonight I'm going to dinner uh, with my wife and we're going to go to a really nice restaurant and we're probably going to enjoy a couple glasses of wine. And, you know, the day after or two days after, my workouts are always not quite as sharp uh, as if I didn't drink alcohol. Now, why am I still going to have some wine? Well, what's more important to me is the loosening up and enjoying my time with my wife tonight, right? So, And that's the balance that I'm kind of talking about. Here's the irony of all of this, right, is that the long-term success results, all that stuff, is better with balance, yeah. not the extreme. And it actually gets easier. It does. It's a lot easier when you learn to do that. Like, I mean, it took me a long time to be okay with, you know, stringing three or four days off of not training right. and just enjoying other aspects uh, without like freaking out of, ah, oh, man, I'm fucked up or I've set back. And, yeah. Because that causes that like on and off the wagon behavior where you just, you go one extreme, the other. Oh, I'm off. Okay. Now I'm off the training. Now I'm eating like shit. Now I'm doing everything that's not aligned. Yeah, it's not worth that. it to do anything right. else. Right. And I, ha I really had that attitude for a long time and I just, I don't think that way anymore. In fact, I've gotten better about, you know, oh, you know, sometimes I'm really consistent in the gym. Uh, and everything's flowing that way, and I'm getting to eat a ton of calories. And then other times, oh, just I'm not. I'm sitting down a lot. I'm not getting to the gym, and so I have to adjust my lifestyle according. And it doesn't take that much of adjustment. Just the the mindfulness of, oh, okay, I'm, I haven't trained in four or five days. I need to make sure that I'm very uh, conscious of what I'm consuming. And it doesn't take a lot of effort. And I actually maintain a pretty close physique to where I like. And then I know that as soon as I get back on it and five days later, my body responds right away. And then I'm right yeah. back where I left off versus the pendulum swinging this way, then swinging. The you know, other what's way. funny about all this too, by mm -hmm. the way, is that if you become obsessive with your training, your, what you would consider an ideal physique starts to move further and further away from what is considered healthy and what even the average person likes, right? If you're really into working out, you may see someone at 4% body fat 
you know, extreme and be like, that's yeah. a great physique. Then if you ask the average person. Keep moving your goalposts. Yeah, then you ask the average person, they'll be like, oh, that doesn't look good. That's like, mm. they're way too sucked up or that doesn't look too good. Like they would look better with a little bit more body fat or oh, that's a little too extreme. And it's true. It's like, I remember going to a bodybuilding show uh, for the first time and I was in my 20s. And this is when I was really into it. And I remember backstage for a moment looking at everybody's faces because I was backstage with my buddy. My buddy was competing. And I remember looking at everybody's faces, the men and the women, and thinking, oh my God, they look, if you just look at their faces, they look really, they look unhealthy because they are, right? Mm -hmm. They're on stage, the, the dieting that's required and all that craziness going to the competition. And then I, you know, and I thought about all my clients, my average clients, when I would show them pictures of these extreme physiques, none of them would say, that's, a, that's amazing. All of them would say, oh, that's too extreme. So the irony really is, uh, you know, if you have balance and real health, you'll look, you'll, you'll objectively will probably look the best to most people. Uh, mm -hmm. The extremes are what we tend to get obsessed with when we're already in that obsessed, you know, state of mind. Well, speaking of extremes, I was listening to a really interesting podcast uh, recently uh, with the guys from the social social dilemma, and Joe Rogan just uh, had him back on. Uh, yeah, so that one that was on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys yeah, yeah, are yeah. familiar with such that. a good, such a good movie. Talking about the algorithms mm -hmm. and and uh, you know the the detriments of it in terms of radicalizing people and and you know kind of pushing them into more of the extremes, uh, and there. Were, I haven't finished the whole thing is like three hours, but you know, they got into some interesting topics in terms of like where we're at in terms of like two dystopian sort of options of where we're going to go with this and, and you know, how we're going to be able to kind of wrangle this whole social uh, platform. Uh, and you know, they, they looked at it like from an example of how China is actually dealing with this in terms of like actually putting limiters in there with the feed and, 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 having these options of where they actually show educational type of uh, material with their form of TikTok. So that way, you know, they put limiters and regulations on the way that kids are using it. Like they're doing a lot of like uh, really controlling kind of measures, uh, but they're taking it seriously. Like this is a, this is a, you know, something that we have to really consider uh, addressing uh, versus like on the other end is sort of the chaos, like it's going to kind of work itself out kind of a model. Uh, and then there was like the third option, which is, you know, Taiwan, which they're trying to discuss is, you know, kind of bringing it back to the whole policy making and, and everything of, of people like seeing both sides and being able to like create more transparency with the whole process. Well, this is the, the scary part of America and being as free as we are is we're most likely to take the path of we'll figure it out after and, the and, chaos. And we'll, path. Yeah. We'll learn by running into the brick wall a few times before we realize we need to go around or climb over it. Um, so I think that's what we have ahead of us. I don't see, I don't, I definitely don't see us regulating that and putting restrictions unless you're your parent, right? As a household, you might see it. Um, but I don't think that we're going to see policy around that, at least not right now, not until we see some serious mm -hmm. uh, consequences for not doing that, which we may see. We may see some stuff come out in the next decade that we go, holy shit, or we might go all in and you see what's going with the direction we're moving with metaverse. I, I'm not sure what this is going to look like. I, I still stand by my ori original prediction, which is that I think we are going to divide the country in half. Uh, not literally right down the middle, but you know, there's going to be a good portion of people that choose to be plugged in, and then there's going to be a good portion of people that want to unplug. And I think that, and then of course, you'll have some hybrids of people that have good balance in their life and can go in and out. But I think it's going to be kind of an all in for a big portion of people on the metaverse NFT thing. And then I think there's going to be uh, all in people are like, I want nothing to do with mm -hmm. that. And then something in the middle. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, so here's the problem. We, we identify an issue and then we forget that the potential solution is probably going to be worse. And so here's what I mean by that. So it's either, mm -hmm. either you allow the consumer to drive what social media does. There's problems with that, obviously. Uh, consumers don't often make in my opinion, the best decisions for themselves. I mean, as evidenced by the obesity epidemic, right? So people mm -hmm. often make bad choices for themselves, but is the better option to, <laughs> to give the government, uh, you know, the power to dictate right. this power and what they present to you. For example, would I rather have 
consumers dictate what Facebook and Instagram and Twitter show or the Chinese communist government. Yeah. I think I'd choose Facebook and Instagram and because that's driven by consumers versus Chinese communist propaganda, for example. That and, and we have our own propaganda. Do I trust our government, which is probably in cahoots with a lot of these companies anyway? Like just like I wouldn't trust them well, to make regulations on food. I I wouldn't trust look, I think it's a good idea. I think it would be beneficial if we could kind of help people eat right. Do I trust the people in office to do that? Not even close. They would make things far worse. And you don't believe me. Look at all the FDA food pyramid, regula- you know, all the stuff that they recommended. You've, had you followed their advice, you'd probably be in terrible health. So this is a tough situation. I don't think there's a clear answer, but I do think the answer is not giving less people more power mm-hmm. over it. I don't mm-hmm. think that's a better option. I really don't. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think the difficulty, though, is a lot of people are unaware. Yeah. Uh, and there's no transparency in terms of because – there's uh, ways that these private companies uh, manage and operate uh, their business, uh, and they sort of have the the that they're the ones in, in control of the keys in terms mm-hmm. of you know introducing uh, even like these foreign troll farms, for instance, that create uh, distrust, that create I- I- incendiary, inflammatory information that gets spread like wildfire. Dude, that's a big deal. Which is huge. And, and how do we stop that from happening when uh, your private companies actually encourage it because it, it creates more engagement yeah, it with helps the their algorithms, algorithms yeah, yeah. Uh, which then has fractured uh, the very country that we all live in? Yeah, yeah. I, now, yeah I, I, look, I, we, we have a distinct constitution it's in our constitution that the federal government's job is to protect our borders i do think that falls under that but it, look and here's the bottom line it's gonna suck no matter what yeah. if, if we look at like processed food for example processed food really didn't become a big part of americans diets until probably the 60s and 70s and then it really started to ramp up and people were aware that if you eat too much and you eat wrong and you don't exercise you become obese yet it still happened and it's still growing because we're human, we're not perfect, and we can be manipulated by our urges and desires and all that stuff. Social media is doing the same thing, but the alternative probably is worse. So it's like the cat's out of the bag. What do we do? Do we allow the consumer, which is millions of people in America, dictate it, or do we give that power to a few people who I, we I already think, know are not are corrupt. I don't think we're going to do that. I don't think we're going to do that at all. In fact, in, in using your your processed food analogy, I actually think what's going to end up happening, which is going to be really interesting, what exactly what it looks like, is it's going to open up an entire new market. It's going to open up just like there's a market for personal trainers and gyms to help yep. people who overconsume and eat. Totally. There is going to be a massive market to help people with their social media addiction and virtual I, reality. I agree. Addiction. And you know which market's going mm-hmm. to be the, the, the leader in that? Health. The health and fitness. Yeah, health and, and fitness. Market. I, think, right. I think we'll see it first. And so I do. And I, I'm sure there's already people that are probably smart enough to already be addressing this mm-hmm. with clients and stuff. So that's what I predict. I don't think America is going to come out and, and do pull a move like China is and, and put regulation and policy in place. I think we're going to allow it to unfold. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that self-regulate, just like there's a lot of people out there that yeah. know not to overconsume and eat and stay active and they don't need any help and support. And then there's the majority of people and the majority of people who kind of blindly walk through life and, and don't pay attention to these signals uh, will get sucked into it because it is very yeah. powerful and tempting. And then that's going to open a whole new market and space for you, people to help. You, you, guys are, you guys are aware of uh, Orwell and Huxley. Yeah. No, no, what's that? Those two different authors. Yeah. No, no. So Orwell was more like 1984, like was Big Brother, like oh, oh, dystopian okay. that's why that future that's familiar. very much like, you know, sort of, I guess, comparable to like a China situation. 1984 where, is eerily predictive. It's like very- predicted what's happening. That's predictive. eerie, but also Huxley, though, I mean, I guess Brave New World, I think, mm. but- uh, you know, talks about like us being super distracted by excess and, uh, you know, like us going more into like indulgence in that mm-hmm. sort of a direction, uh, which is also eerily similar to the future we have. It also talked about like uh, biotechnology and, and the chemicals being like sort of uh, the, the impending doom, uh, which is also very interesting to kind of go back and see some of these science fiction writers predict like the state of the world. It's like almost you they, have your World War II kind of post-World War II Cold War, which happened. And then now almost the Huxley 
Maslian uh, version just as unfolding. Yeah, they they were basically uh, philosophers. Which you know, here's what's and I know it's going to be a little controversial, but his by the way, nothing new. Humans are the same. We've, we're the same as we've been thousands of for thousands of years. It's yes, cyclical. our environment. Yes, our environments have changed. But our, our weaknesses are exactly yeah, the same. Yeah, same patterns, same addictions, same, same habits. Shit. There's yeah. no different. Okay, so in the past, what has been the bulwark against all of this has been spiritual practices. Yep. Meditation or religion or philosophy like stoicism, for example. So it's to me, it's not a coincidence that the decline in spiritual practices is coinciding with this increase in over, this abund like overuse and addiction and uh, you know distraction, right? Mm -hmm. The solution has to come from there. I think about it like with health and fitness. There's almost a spiritual practice with finding balance in a world where I can eat whatever the hell I want. So much food, it's so cheap, and if I want, I could literally walk zero all day long and not move and be in front of my computer. But there's almost a spiritual practice that I have to uh, mold with my fitness practice and my nutrition to make it something that becomes kind of this long-term thing. And if you talk to anybody who has a good balance with it, that's how they communicate it. Spiritual practices are the the solution, and unfortunately, we've become less and less. This is like less and less important to us because we think we've solved all of our problems with all this stuff that we've created. No, well, and that's it's just that's not. a whole other category of like addressing your health holistically. Totally, right? just like we opened up the podcast. It's like you know your relationships; they do have a massive impact, and thankfully, they have a study out there that kind of shows like a comparable. Uh, you know, effect of like smoking th that many packs of cigarettes. Like I'm sure, you know, a devoid of of spiritual practice has an effect on us as well. well Dude, we're whatever not, that we're looks not, like. We are not far away from people having everything that they pretty much need. We were just talking on the show. The two things we talked about, the, the bacteria being able to uh, make food, the 3D printing of houses yeah. for under 10 grand. We are not far away, you guys. In our lifetime, we are going to see like housing taken care of for a lot of people that are homeless and the ability to create food out of pretty much almost nothing. To be able to create drugs yeah. uh, in your home. It's going, to be, it's going to be really interesting when we solve a lot of these things that we think are is the, pro the massive problem that that we all have. Well, imagine if you took like really powerful, like what's a really powerful prescription opiate? What would be like a like Vicodin or Oxycontin. Percocet or Oxycontin? Okay. Yeah. Imagine you took Oxycontin and you went 50,000 years into the into the past <laughs> and you're like going up to people and say, hey, you feel bad and you feel sad. Take this. And like, oh my God, I feel so good. Mm -hmm. you're, you've solved all of my problems. Have you? Yeah. We all know what happens when people fall in love with good feelings yeah. with drugs. It starts to destroy you. So this is all spiritual practice shit. I'm telling you, look, there's a reason why. And if you talk like Arthur Brooks, he's, an, he's one of my favorite people. He's an expert on happiness. And he says very clearly that challenge, abstinence, um, you know, uh, things that are hard are part of what make you happy. By yeah, the way, anybody who's a parent, anybody who's a parent understands this. Like having a kid 100% makes life harder. 100% <laughs> makes it more stressful. Mm -hmm. You don't get as much sleep. You're not going to be able to go out and do what you want as much. You lose a lot of freedom. You know, you probably will wreck your body for a second, especially if you're the one that had the baby. And well, I can list all the all the stuff that happens to you. But you talk to any, you know, good parent and you say, but do you have more meaning in your life and more purpose? Do you find life to mean something different than it did before? Absolutely. Would you trade it? Would you trade, give up your kid to be able to have all the freedom in the world and do all these other things. And most good parents would say never, not in a million years. So how strange is that? Well, right? we we speculated a long time ago that this was the reason for the rise on the uh, obstacle course racing. I mean, that's think about how weird that is. Just yeah. just 40 years ago, people would look at you weird for signing up for that. I know. Well, it's the same when they were farming and working really hard jobs, and now some there's gyms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What the fuck? Or is how this? about how about that's wealthy people? Yeah. Or how about wealthy people? Who are like, oh, I, you know, my company IPO'd, I can retire. And what do they do? They go buy a farm and start farming. Yeah, yeah. I know people like this. Like they got cows and chickens and they work eight hours a day on their farm and they're like, oh, this is the life. Yeah. You know? There's it's a simple life. It's I'm telling you, man, it's the spiritual side of things. That can be religion, it can be philosophy, and it could be other things. And if you don't have that in your life, what you're stuck with is the material world. It will always fail. It is going to fail to deliver. And I'm not, it's not just me talking. I'm not some 
Spiritual guru, by the way. All the scientific studies. You're just wearing the shirt. Show this. Yeah. Oh, I am. Aren't I? Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 super true. And you like know, this, you know, we're close when when homeless guys have got iPhones. You know what I'm saying? They're, you they're, know, we're getting close. Did you know that? You see were, that? Did you know that I went to? I, I there was a homeless dude uh, a while ago, and I pulled over, opened my window, and then realized I didn't have money, yeah. and he had. Um, what what is that on your what phone? What are they on? Are they on Cricket Wireless? Like like like, like uh, Square or whatever. Yeah. The the homeless guy. No, oh, he, he had a Square. So yes, did, he did. No, wow. he didn't. I could have given him money through Square, <laughs> so like a credit great. card. You know, he's a homeless. That's dude. like Silicon Valley bums. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, so, it's got to be like unique. To it, yeah, it's got to be here, right? People, I get it. People that listen to us from really, all over the country yeah. and the world are got to be going like, that ain't around us. That ain't like that. But it is true here. I have seen. He's like, Can I've you Venmo me? Several. Yeah homeless guys that had iPhones, dude. So that's crazy to me. And so that has got to be this sign that we are not far from this this place of where you're going to have... I mean, Tom Bill, you said it on our show four or five years ago when we first interviewed him. Anything and that can be free will that's be That's right. It stuck with me is that anything that can be free will be free. And, and you know, we really kind of built this business operating that way, thinking like, oh my God, we got to make sure that we are we're coming first from that place yeah. of like providing so much good, free, valuable content because the consumer expects it now. Mm -hmm. The consumer de demands that because so many things can be done for free and shared with so many people. So. Dude, it's so funny that how uh, like really smart writers uh, really tap into old uh, like human wisdom, like the movie The Matrix. That, that's a relatively recent movie. I know I'm old, so it's like, what, 20-something years old, but relatively recent in the sense that it's not hundreds or thousands of years old. And there's that one scene, I love it, where they capture Morpheus mm -hmm. and Agent Smith is trying to crack his head, right? Crack yeah. his brain so he could get the codes to Zion or whatever. Yeah. And he explains to them how the original Matrix that the, that the machines created to plug all the humans in was a perfect human utopia. You guys had everything. It was perfect. But we had massive... Uh, you know, fields, they called fields of all the people, crash because your yeah, feeble human minds- it. Yeah, your minds rejected it because you have to have hardship in your life. This is like the human condition. It's like it's like fitness. I swear to God, it, this is 100% true. And it's it's if, part of the purpose formula. You, I, if you were fit and sh shredded and muscular and you got there with no hard work, no discipline, no nothing, you would get a fraction of the benefit. Yeah. As you would get from the work and fulfillment and joy, from all it. of it, right? Yeah. Like you, literally, the only fraction of the the, the benefit you would get is the, the fact look. that yes, yeah, you look good, which is okay. And I know this is going to sound temporarily would feel good, but then would be fleeting. Yes, and also, and I know that as people listening to this or watching this who you know have trouble being consistent won't believe it. Just like trying to tell somebody who wants millions of dollars that that's not going to make them happy. They don't believe you until they get there. I'm going to tell you right now. You talk to anybody who's been working out forever. And the look is actually probably less than 5% of the value of exercise yeah. and nutrition. It's really not a big deal at all. But just like a poor person who becomes rich, initially it's not that way. Of course. Right? If you work your ass off of obtaining a physique and you finally get to this, this ultimate physique, there's, a, there's this temporary satisfaction that you have of, oh my God, this yeah. is amazing and it feels so good. But it quickly- You go back to baseline. Yeah, it quickly goes away. So when uh, so again, talking about Arthur Brooks again, who's an expert on this, it works the other way too. So they do studies on people who get like a windfall of money or something crazy happens, right? And they're, I forgot the timeline. It was something like for two years or a year, they're like happier. And then it goes back down to baseline. It works the other way too. Somebody who has a terrible thing happen to them, like yeah. they lose an arm or you know, they go paralyzed or something really bad. After a couple years, they come right back up to baseline. So it does work both ways. I think it's so interesting. And if we ignore our human psyche in the pursuit of all this stuff, man, we are totally, you know, totally doomed. Yeah. You know what I mean? You guys uh you guys getting ready yet for the holidays? Christmas, Thanksgiving, what's everybody got plans got going on right now? Yeah, I'm excited for Christmas. Has you guys done any of your cuz you guys were worried about supply chain stuff? You started your shopping at all or anything like that? Black Friday stuff? What's yeah, going on? Yeah, lists. Uh yeah. yeah, hopefully like we're trying to get ahead, you know. I'm sure everybody's in that sort of mentality of like trying to get their shopping started a little bit earlier. Yeah. Well, year. I mean, obviously as the, the this this particular show is airing on Black Friday, it's like the biggest sale you know, time of the year. Yeah. Then you have uh, Cyber One. Uh, was it Cyber Monday? Monday? Cyber yeah. Monday. Yeah. So Black Friday now become like a four. What are so today's today's commercials, Doug? We have Caldera and we have Chili. What are the what are the uh, the deals that they're running? Do you know what they're <clears throat> running for Black Friday? I know Caldera Lab has thirty percent off, which is their oh, best wow. discount oh, wow. of the entire year. Wow. You know, you want to know what's funny? Of all the partners 
that we work with. <laughs> There's two that I went from thinking, like totally thinking, never going to use this product. Mm -hmm. Caldera Adam was like big on, and so that's why we brought it on board. I was like, I don't put stuff on my skin. I don't care. <laughs> the other one was the Juve Light. Both of them completely yeah. changed my mind. I now use Caldera every single day. I've never used anything on my face that's really made an impact because Me I too. have oily skin anyway. But it's we like, have that. We actually have all of us are very similar in that. I just experienced it first. Yeah, I just started using it and I noticed something right away and I thought, oh, this is kind of crazy. And uh, and then I think you guys went through the same process. You just started doing it consistently, and then once you do it, just like the Juve, you got to do it consistently. You do it one time, you're not going to stand in front of a light like that or try yeah. something like that and be like, oh my god, this is crazy. But if you're consistent with it, you really start to see a difference. Well, it's interesting because they kind of market more to men, right? Uh, Caldera. And There's a lot of women that have it. Dude, Dude, Courtney, my wife stole mine. Courtney steal mine all the time. Yeah. Was the point I'm trying to like? It, it's like half gone already, but like she loves it. Yeah. Like, and, and so she's like, why doesn't? Why don't they market this more to women? And I'm it like, has I a very. It, I know it has a very masculine look to the bottle and stuff like that, but it has a very neutral like smell to it. it doesn't smell masculine or feminine. It's got a very nice neutral smell. So yeah, yeah Katrina no, really likes no, it too. What, what's cool about it is it's balancing because the three of us have very different skin, right? You have sometimes psoriasis. Yeah. Justin's more on the dry side yeah. and I'm oily. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, I'm going to put oil on my skin. I'm just going to, and I've done this before. I'll put stuff on my skin. I break out because I'm naturally oily anyway. So I'm like, forget it. It balanced my skin out, right? Justin puts it on and it does the same thing to him and the same thing to you. Yeah. So like whatever they treats me. <laughs> yeah, whatever they've done has been kind of a like they've knocked it out of the out of the park for Did sure. Did you look up uh, Chili's? Do you know what they are doing or do they not tell us? They yet? didn't tell us anything, but uh, they do have a discount on the website when you go over there. Yeah, so you'll see it on their site. In, I know in, they will. I mean, all of our partners end up having something going speaking on. Speaking of so. speaking of which, now that's getting colder. Now where you guys are at, you guys are over the hill. Yeah, is it yeah. is it warmer than here in San Jose or colder? Well, it's getting cold. Yeah, yeah it's we're getting, starting to feel the the winter coming in. Okay. For sure. Oh so, yeah, no, so nights, nights nights are. I mean, I've been running my fireplace every night for the last. So like, is, are the wives turned up the heat <laughs> yeah, on the chili? Dude. On yeah, the chili yeah. Bed? No, Katrina's. In fact, I was getting yelled at yesterday because somehow hers got. I think somebody or her or the cleaners unplugged it and so it disconnected from my app oh. and so we were climbing in last night and i so i leave the the bedroom door open at night to like make the room like ice cold before we get in there and i don't feel bad because i know her side's 90 something degrees right uh so the room was like i like like see your breath cold last night and we get in there and uh she was like ah <laughs> I do the same, <laughs> dude. But the only thing, so both dogs and Courtney's kind of create a bad habit with this. Uh, when I'm gone and, and go up to like you know truck here, we're on like somewhere for business, and you know she'll let them kind of come up and and sneak up on the bed and sleep, uh -huh. and and so like I like to keep it cold, and so uh, both dogs like find their way up and I'm like kicking Arlo off because he's the big heavy one and so I just like, <laughs> just throw him off the bed dog, I'm like dude. no <laughs> you know and we still haven't got our king size yet so I'm like dude there's no room for any of this nonsense a queen? Are you sleeping? Yeah, on a queen? queen. Yeah, bro. bro you seen, can't be sleeping. Oh, on you queen. haven't you haven't seen his place yet? I've have been you? waiting no, like for ever. his place. No, dude. I know. He I has this. Picture. He has this. <laughs> he looks he has like this. a little kid bed. So you okay? You see my place, right? Yeah, you yeah. know our downstairs master bedroom. Yeah, how yeah, big yeah. that is. Yeah. So his he's a big master bedroom like that, and he's got this little fucking queen in the middle. It looks so. <laughs> it's embarrassing. It looks so funny. I can't. I cannot sleep. Big old massive room. I can't sleep with a partner in a bed that's anything other than a cow king. Cow king's wider. Just yeah. doesn't work, dude. You're on well, top Cal of the Well, Cal King's the long one. Though. Oh, is that yeah, what it is? Yeah. 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 Eastern, Eastern King is wider. Well, I mean, that's the one I'm getting. Cal King the, the is wider than a, a king, or that's, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, it's wider, wider and longer. And okay. But yeah. the, then they have an Eastern King, that's even which, wider, which is even wider. But then it's, it's shorter. That's the one I'm oh, getting. Yeah. So, yeah. so, your little yeah. Feet, your feet so if you're if you're I don't want my feet. If you're six foot, I want the monsters. If you're six foot and under, an Eastern King isn't isn't bad. But if you're over six foot, you want a Cal King because it gives you a little bit more extension. No, I'm like a like Jessica and I could not be more different. I'm literally a furnace, so I'm laying in bed and I'm in my, you know, my little, you know, European Speedo underwear and my I'm just sprawled out. No sheets. Jessica has a bathrobe, pajamas, and is covered mm -hmm. in the... And then what she does sometimes is she'll come over and hug me, mm -hmm. but it doesn't last very long because she's like, you're just a heater. Oh, yeah. You're making me sweat and she's got to move away. <laughs> totally different. So I thought this was just a man thing, but we've got Katrina's dad staying with us right now and he's never been in our place and he came over. I came home and when I walked in the house, it's like, uh, what, I got home by like four o'clock or something at like 4.30. And I roll in the house and he's uh, in a, you know, his full daily outfit. And then he has a robe 
on and over and I walk in, it's like four thirty in the afternoon. He's in my living room with in a robe. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? Getting ready for bed already, Dad? Or what? Yeah. He's like, oh man, you keep it cold in here. Oh, yeah. I walk over and it's seventy degrees in the house. I'm like, this. What? I'm like, oh my god. Now I know where your daughter gets it from for sure oh, because man. Katrina's always, oh, it's so cold in here. I'm like, it's seventy, dude. The, seventy yeah. is not my cold. My dad likes heat as well. I can't stand it. Oh, there's the breakdown to the the cow king. So the cow the, king's actually not as wide as a king. It's just longer. Yeah. No, it's cow king is 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 four inches wider. No, it's seventy two. Cow oh, king is seventy two inches wide. Seventy six inches wide. Yeah, I did not yeah. know a regular That's king is wider. Where one. is yeah. the eastern king, Doug? I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, eastern an eastern king is more like the uh, well, it's even more than the the cow. King. I thought the cow king was wider and longer. I even, I'm totally wrong. Yeah. That's annoying. Yeah. That's interesting <laughs> that it's not. Uh, well, that's what I need, dude. That I it's need not longer like than the king. I did not know that. Distance. Yeah, that's uh, that's wild. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. The yeah. coldest house that I ever stayed in easily was my grandparents. Now, they, consider they were poor Sicilians, and they came here as immigrants, and money was tight. Right. And my grandfather will not put the heater on as long as you can warm yourself with sweaters, jackets, and blankets. Yeah, that's, and that's my theory, dude. <laughs> literally, bro. I would I would be there, and my grandparents would be. We'd we're all sit down and watch TV. Bed. And literally, I'd be cold with a blanket. My grandfather would go get your jacket. Yes. So we'd be on the we'd be on the couch in our jackets. I'm so this ha- I'm so this- I'm gonna be an old man like him for Are sure. You? I'm always telling Katrina, go, go go put a beanie on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, give me your house. Turn yeah. the heater off for God's sake. So I'm supposed to wear a parka. I'd have a parka on uh. in there. And they're still like that. My grandfather's still like that. He'll sit in his lazy boy chair. Watch TV, and I look downstairs, and there he is. He got a jacket and sweats and a hat on. I just, it's like yeah. night and day different. That's why, I mean, the reason why uh, Chili has been up there with one of my favorite partners is because the, the difference of me going to bed and being being cool is oh, night and day different. If I am yeah. if I am just the so slightest sleep, bit warm, dude. it throws my sleep off. Really? Yeah. Heaven forbid, I'm hot. I'm hot. You may as well just. That night's fucked. I'm gonna have a bad night of sleep for sure. So being cold makes a huge difference now, for me. Do you notice when you get hot though too? Like it makes me like need to get up and go yeah. and go. To the I gotta pee go more. Yeah. I'm restless. I can't get comfortable. You it's know what awful. I hate? So what I hate was when I'm hot, I'll sweat. Right. So I'll sweat and sleep, and then I'll get up because I gotta pee. And now I'm kind of like cool because I had sweat. I was sweating and I'm oh, walking gross. through. Yeah. And then I go lay down on the bed and it's wet. Yeah, that's gross. <laughs> oh, I that's hate not, that. That's, that's, not uh, that's not comfortable. So Eastern mm. King is what, Doug? What's the difference there? Same as a king. Oh, what? It's yes, exactly the exact same, same size. So it's they marketing. They just labeled it Eastern. This, yeah, it's just marketing. Adam I guess. got. Adam got. Uh, this is. I mean, you're getting. You got bad information, Doug. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Google, yeah. you're wrong. You step okay. Up your misinformation. Adam got bamboozled. Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. That's some Russian troll. Yeah, really. that's really. Well, yeah. you also are showing two different. The, the last thing you showed us, the sizes were different than that too. No, they? no, they had king and cow king. This is Eastern king and king. So yeah. everything I'm seeing is Eastern king and. Regular king are, are the exactly the same wow. dimension. Wow! What a what's it's pure marketing. Wow! That's now there's why, other why there's Eastern other beds that oh there's a, look at that one up there right right there this one right here yes what does that say it says exactly what we've been talking about oh really the king and, and the cow king or well, eastern king me. and I king got, it's, got all, it's all the same there's an what's an Alaskan king bed I just saw that click uh, on that real quick. <laughs> it's probably a cow king for Alaska I mean, so are anything outside of that would they be considered like custom you have to customize it to make it any, like there's bigger beds obviously. Yeah. Whoa, Alaskan. Yeah. Whoa, look that's, at the size of that. Oh, that's awesome. That's you fit your whole family on Shit, that bad boy. One of those. That's what I'm talking about. That's, oh, yeah, yeah. It's nine feet by nine feet. Oh, yeah, that's sick. Son. That's, what that Paul, hey, sick. that's what Paul Check sleeps on. He's got this two Bro, wives. I'm all about that. No, he divides the women up, dude. He doesn't sleep them together. Oh, he doesn't yeah, have them in the same yeah, room? No, They have bro. different quarters. They have different quarters, and they have different days, I think, even. like he, yeah. Yeah, They've scheduled it to where it's like, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays with one wife. He's on a whole nother level. You know what I predict? You know what I predict with that kind of like lifestyle where you have have like more than one wife or Fucking whatever. stressful as shit. Are you I, me? Bro, I predict, this is what I think. I think at first you think, oh, this is cool. I got, you know, two wives. The reality is when you're at work, you know, not there, they're just, they're working together. <laughs> now you're, now it's you. It's two on one. Yes, dude. It's each each two other. on one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, one of the things I love about Paul you. Check that's different than a lot of those other guys that were, that are into the, you know, open relationships and the multiple wives and stuff like that. I felt like when I asked Paul about that, he was really honest about it. Yeah. Like, I think he just, I mean, he, he admittedly obviously loves both of them and they've found a way to make it work. 
but he gave me that feeling of uh, like the look, like if like, I could go do it extra. all over again, I yeah. wouldn't have done yeah. it this way. <laughs> it's more work. Than <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like uh, you, they, like some people play it off like it's so amazing. It's the most amazing life ever to have these yeah. open relationships so and multiple wives. Yeah. And then all of them take a shit. I mean, yeah. we when we first started this podcast, I can think of at least four people that were close to us that were in relationships like this none of them are in those relationships or they're in turmoil well, let's be honest oh, yeah. okay how hard is it to have a long-term forever one right? one with, wife yeah with one partner you're gonna throw more people in the mix more challenges yeah. more changes more the only positive is a little more bit more work. variety the sexual desires that's yeah. it the sexual desire side is the only side that it is and let's be honest like when you've been in a relationship forever, yeah, what how long does that last? Yeah, what percentage by the minute? Okay, if you been, how much time you actually spend doing that of your day and week and month and year is is that? Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I could, just, I just imagine like I come home and you know my two or three wives are sitting there like we need to have a talk. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> all three of you? Yeah, we all decided. I feel like us. the, I feel like oh, the, man, I lost. the hall pass strategy would be a better right. strategy if you wanted to go that direction what instead of like. Like if you, I've heard of relationships where people have like a, an annual one week hall pass where they give like <laughs> it's like the purge. What? Yeah, <laughs> you've never heard of people doing this? this. They made like a whole movie on. There was like a movie on this that was like uh, a, oh it was hey, like a comedy. Pass, I think it's February. You know what that means? Don't you? Yeah, there do is, people okay, actually look do up that, look though? up the movie. I think it's I think it's actually called Hall Pass, mm -hmm. and it's actually really funny because like Vince Vaughn's this, in it, right? I think so. And yeah. the because the, the wife is like pitching it or the, the this Owen what, Wilson. I know. Is, oh, yeah, this yeah, that's who it is. Owen Wilson and the guy from Saturday Night Night Live. Um, it's really fun. Have I you not seen it, Sal? No. Oh, you should. Well, it's hilarious because this guy, uh, one of the one of the wives, says, "Oh yeah, you you should." She's trying to convince this other wife that you you know to save or help their marriage that she should give him a hall pass because I think he's like drooling over like pictures or like right. staring at the hot girl and she's like, <laughs> he's and they got the into fights or that. Yeah. She's like, why just give him a hall pass? And she's like, are you kidding me? She's like, listen, trust me. I've been doing this for years. Just watch. And so the whole movie is about the guys getting the hall pass. They got this whole week and it's hilarious the way it plays out because they don't ever do anything. You know, they talk a big game. They yeah. call all their friends. Well, of course, the girls are the ones that end up getting. Yeah, know, yeah. Like, yeah. It, yeah, dude. No, it's like no. Obvious. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's a hilarious. If they're, you they're, they're all out of the game. You yeah, know, they're, it's been they're. so long. Oh, I'm going to watch that. If you haven't watched it, it's really funny. Is it really? Yeah. And I've I've heard of people that do this, that they have this, you know, it's just a you go off and do your thing. We it's don't like ask. people with their diets. I love a cheat day. Saturday's Monday. Well, Tuesday, I mean, I, I don't know if this would be anything that we'd ever do or I think it would work, but I feel like. I would lean towards this strategy before I think I'm just going to like marry two yeah. or have that. Adam's like, low oh. key trying to close right now. <laughs> 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 if I did anything, it would uh, be I think I've been working on Katrina for that for a long time. It doesn't work. No way. It's not, <laughs> no, it's not happening. It's That's not happening. hilarious. So. Just want a new I, flavor. That's hey, all. talk about an ego check though, right? If you get your hall pass, nobody wants to hook up with you. Uh, yeah. So and what happened, honey? Did you get I nothing? Well, that's what would exactly. probably happen. It looks to like you're most the only dudes, one that likes Most dudes me. think it's a great idea. Then they do it. Then the wife ends up hooking up with a bunch of people. You don't hook up with nobody. And then you're it's the one it. who's all insecure about it. Meanwhile, Backfire. you're the one who wanted to do it. Come on, dude. <laughs> Women have way more sexual power than men do. Let's oh, be honest. Yeah. Let's close. be honest. They got hundred percent. Yeah. If there's a hall pass, your wife's gonna. <laughs> she's got a. We're gonna way. cash that in. No problem. Yeah. She's gonna cash that in. You're gonna be. You're gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna get all these chicks, and you get nothing. Yeah. You know what's that other movie? There's another movie where the couples all go on a retreat. Yeah, couples retreat. Couples retreat. So again, oh, that movie yeah. cracked me up. There's yeah. that one that scene funny. where the dude's getting a massage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's the yoga instructor, right? And he's kind of yeah. Uh, yeah, putting them through. And, like the, and then there's the one guy who's getting a massage. I don't remember his name. He's the heavier set guy. He was also in the movie. Um, that what's that one movie? That's so money. Yeah, swingers. Swingers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. He's Mikey. Yeah, he's the um, what's um, his name? He's a writer, isn't he? The one yeah. that writes a lot. Writer, of these. director. Yeah. What didn't he write that? Uh, Vince Vaughn's buddy. I can't yeah, even his name right yeah. now. Why the Mandalorian? Uh, he, he wrote a great. Uh, what did, what's his name, Doug? I know. You're looking at me like another name. I, I know Justin. Will I just know. can't think I of Justin him. knows the name. Of I, him. I know the name out. too. I can't think of. Didn't it right. he just write for what movie was it? Was it he's Star Wars or something that he was so good? Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Yeah. He was excellent. Anyway, I like the scene where he's trying to get a massage. John Favreau. John Favreau. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And he's Favreau. trying to like feel out if the massage therapist is going to give him a hand job. Yeah. He's like, oh, you know, just real tight right about here. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if you can release some of that tension. Yeah. And she's, you know, it's like, come on, dude. So You're so good. stupid. So good. Hey, real quick. Do you like soda but hate the sugar? Do you like the way soda tastes but you hate the way it makes you look and feel? Well, you got to try Olipop. So Olipop are sodas, naturally flavored, very low calories, very low calories, and check this out, 
good for your gut health. They actually include ingredients that help feed beneficial bacteria in your gut. And again, it tastes like soda. We love Olipop. Go check them out. Head over to drinkolipop.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump for 20% off plus free shipping on your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Adam from Wisconsin. Hey, what's up, Adam? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, so I've been um, uh, lifting for years now, uh, probably since my, my my teen years, really seriously, and currently on a strength, uh, strength building program, lifting um, six or so days a week. Three of those days are are the major lifts, bench, squat, and deadlift, and then three of the other days are dedicated to kind of cardio and accessory work. Um, I move a lot uh, around at my job. Um, I'm on my feet quite a bit, and so I probably get 20,000 or so steps a day. Um, uh, several years ago, I was eating pretty low calorie and have been reversing back up just slowly um, and with some weight gain. So right now I'm weighing around uh, 240 pounds. I'm in my late 30s. Um, and I'm reversed back up to 2,500 calories a day. Um, I've, I have, I've, I've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and my doctor, and I've seen a couple of different doctors and gotten second opinions. They all say my labs are within normal range. And I'm kind of worried that cutting from this current caloric level will be challenging, um, given the, given the context and, um, worried about kind of upping, upping, uh, upping calories without increasing activity will gain, will, will increase weight gain. Um, and again, I've just seen a couple different specialists just kind of running into a wall and don't want to, you know, go out and seek a guru, another guru to, to answer questions. So I just thought I'd, uh, reach out to you all and see what you had, uh, had in mind. Okay. Um, so it sounds like a bit, a bit of a challenging situation. Your body weight's at 240, 38. So you're, you're a big dude. How tall are you? I'm six, five. Yes. Okay. So you're a pretty big dude. 2,500 calories a day with that much activity and that Super much low. size is really low. Mm -hmm. right. You have three options here if you want to lose weight. One is to move more. Second is to eat less. Third is to speed up your metabolism. That's the third option. I would go with the third option. You're already moving so much. You're working out six days a week. Uh, I don't think moving more is a good idea. I don't think eating less is a good idea either for a guy your size. That's, that's not very many calories. Now, the key with speeding up your metabolism, you have to focus on muscle gain. And with your the level of activity that you're doing, you're probably doing too much weight. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. You know, six days a week of resistance training, even though you're doing, you know, auxiliary work on the off days is just probably too much. I would bring it down to three days a week, full body resistance training. And you're doing 20,000 steps a day naturally anyway. In other words, it's part of your job. Yeah, that's a I, lot. I don't see any benefit to doing additional cardio, unless you want to improve your endurance and stamina, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. So I would slowly scale back on the cardio, reduce the resistance training, just focus on three days a week, just try to get stronger. And uh, once everything starts to feel good, you see the strength go up, appetite goes up, then you can start to slowly bump your calories again. But I would not want to cut you know, your, your calories at at what you're at now, and I definitely wouldn't want to increase Hell your activity. No. Hell no, he's at 25. You want to, uh, your size, uh, 2,500 calories should be your cut. I mean, we want to get to, a, I'd want to get you to a place where you're <laughs> like three over 3,000. Oh, yeah, 3,500, 240, six, yeah, we say six, six five. five. Yeah, yeah you're, you're not, you're not a little guy at all. You're, and that's a, that's a, a low amount of calories, um, to be eating already. So, and, and I, what my my thing is, if he's doing twenty thousand steps, six days a week weight training plus cardio on top of that, his body is just going and only eating twenty five hundred calories. It's saying like we have to conserve every every bit of calories you you give it because it doesn't think you're going to give it any more food. So I would completely scale back uh, on the cardio, get rid of it all the way, and on the weight training, it would go to an anabolic. So I'd go maps anabolic is what I would run three days a week, full body routine. Now the challenging part. It's going to be the mental piece, right? You, you completely go from six days a week activity, doing cardio, and then you start to slowly. You're not going to need to increase calories that much at first because the reduced amount of activity hopefully will start to add and build muscle. And I would allow my appetite to dictate kind of how I yeah, exactly. start to do that. If you do a good job of just scaling back on all this, giving your body recovery, focus on building strength, Hopefully, in a couple weeks, you right away start to feel the appetite increase and let it allow that to be the signal that says, okay, let's give myself a couple hundred more calories and then start to slowly bump the calories over time. And then 
our long term goal, if you were a client of mine, I would say, hey, let's let's really try and see if we can get you to thirty five hundred calories and kind of mm-hmm. keep your weight about the same, mm-hmm. give or take uh, five pounds or so. And try and slowly get you up there. And then when we're at 35, if you say, hey, I want to lean out, then we can go the other direction. Another challenge, though, recommending uh, anabolic, those trigger session days, we got to keep those really low intensity. Uh, and I know like uh, just having the that scheduled in is another day of like, Technically, it's a workout, but it's really something to, you know, restore and recover. And so if you use it as a way to uh, just stimulate the muscle and get a nice pump, but but don't go, don't overdo it. Don't go overboard with it. Now, you also, uh, at the very end, you wrote in here, you didn't say anything, but you wrote on the question. I see uh, you wrote TRT in question mark. Um, I definitely would do the advice we're giving first, um, but I also would recommend joining the free. We, we opened up the forum for free for everybody. And Dr. Rand and his team at the Regenerative uh, Sport Medicine, they're going to start coming in and speaking twice a month free and basically doing free live Q&As in there uh, twice a month starting in December. So you can have access to that. It's absolutely free. So if you have questions around hormones, thyroid, stuff like that, he would be a great person to the ask. Fo- the forum is called Mind Pump Hormones on Facebook. So it's it's open for free right now. It, you know, a, a, a hormone panel, which I'm sure you probably already did if you're hyperthyroid. Yeah. So I'm assuming they already tested testosterone. They did, yeah. Do, do you know what you're, if you do mind me at, mask, asking what levels you were at? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't have it right off the top of my head. Um, the endocrinologist just said it was within the the normal range, but it was on the low end of the normal range. Yeah, yeah. N- normal range is 300 to 1100. Right. So, you know, right. who, who knows? But um, it's good that you have a baseline. So you could test it again and see where it's at. And, um, you know, I, I would, like Adam said, I would leave that for last because testosterone levels can get, you know, you could lower or raise your testosterone by 30, 40, 50. I've seen people raise or lower it by 50% through lifestyle. You won't double it. But fifty mm-hmm. percent increase uh, I've seen before. Usually, it's around twenty, thirty percent with lifestyle changes. So, you know, I, I would take a look at that. Do you have access to Maps Anabolic, by the way? I do not. No. Okay, follow that program. That's going to be the program for you. Yeah. Follow Maps Anabolic. That's the perfect program for what you're looking to do, and then allow your body to adapt. Give it a chance to adapt. A guy your size, if you get your body wanting to build muscle you're going to be blown away by how much faster your metabolism gets. It's a pretty remarkable um, change when you get it moving in that direction. Cool. You guys are so awesome. We, I really appreciate it. That was where my brain was going, but it's nice to have that that external validation uh, because totally. uh, it's, it's, it's just a – it's the mental game, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, it totally is, and, and it, it's counter to the you know the mainstream right. health advice. Like you said, you talk to your doctor who knows very little about exercise and nutrition, and they're just going to tell you, oh, you know, you probably should eat less or move more, um, because it, yeah, it's that's not really their level of expertise. Um, and yeah, moving more and eating less would definitely get you to lose weight, but boy, would that put you in a tough position at your size? You know, you don't, you don't want to be sitting around. 1900 calories maintenance <laughs> yeah for a six foot big Yikes. ass dude like yeah that. that's real yeah. tough dude so yeah. eating eating less than your girlfriend is that's not a- <laughs> yeah that's tough so <laughs> yeah no we've we've her and i've had that, that conversation uh, <laughs> yeah. so yeah cool. i dig all, it all right so follow maps anabolic and uh gotcha. and, and give it a shot let us know what happens thanks adam uh, thank you thanks you all so much thank you have a good rest of your day huh thanks brother you know the the fact that he's uh, 38 was already thinking that, like, I have hope. I, I When I hear this and we get a question like this, right away I always go back to, like, my mindset at 25. And I always I always wonder, like, when we get someone like this, I always question, like, if I was 25 and heard the advice from you guys telling me to do that, would I listen to it or I'd just be like, yeah, whatever about yeah. it? Because the truth is it's so hard to get when you're doing this much work like you're he's especially obvi- because you're you're hearing counter crappy information from other influencers and stuff like that yeah and you're and you're you're motivated you're motivated to change and you're you're busting your ass six days a week you know moving lifting doing all the stuff he's he's obviously getting after it mm-hmm. and but only eating 2500 calories it's like it's a very frustrating place to be in. yeah the the most uh, in my opinion illuminating study that confirms what we've all experienced with our clients, what what confirms our anecdotes, our hundreds of anecdotes, was a very well done study on the the northern Tanzania tribe, the Hadza tribe, who lives like modern, they they live like hunter-gatherers. They don't have electricity. They move all the time. They run down their prey when they hunt it. 
like extremely active compared to the average person. And when they tested these people, their metabolisms were remarkably similar to the average Western couch potato. So that right there just proves how much your metabolism will adapt to a certain types of activity. And what he's doing is he's telling his body to be efficient with calories. Obviously, a guy 240 pounds at 6'5". Mm -hmm. You know, I, I per, me, who at, at 200 pounds, is I can maintain a sh and be shredded at 2,500 calories a day. He's 240, 6'5". Well, that's what I cut for. for that was my cut for a show. So Which I would, is, I mean, that's that's your lowest, lowest calorie. Yeah, yeah. So I, And I would bulk up. So his size, right, 240. We're not that far off, right? He's 6'5". Six, he's six, I'm 6'3". And I'd get up to about 240 pounds, but I would be eating almost 5,000 calories. And then I'd go down to four, and then I'd go down to 3,500, and then 3,000. And then literally heading into peak week, like the yeah. lowest of lowest calories I'd be at would be 2,500. And that's, uh, I mean, for me, that would have been star like starving my body for like a week or two. So if that's where he's at currently right now, you do not want to have to try and cut from there. He's going to be miserable, even if he did see a few pounds come off. Yep. Our next caller is Becky from Minnesota. What's up, Becky? How can we help you? Hi. I'm so happy to finally get to say hi to you guys. Um, I'm just going to try to keep it short, but um, basically my question boils down to how to keep um, cardiovascular endurance um, during the off season and gain some muscle and strength. Um, just a little background. I have been a long distance runner for about the past 12 years and I love it. Um, nothing makes me happier than going um, for a long run and listening to a podcast. Um, I've done several marathons, half marathons. Um, and in the past three years, I started doing um, sprint triathlons and um, the competitive side really came out in me. Um, and I just, I really got competitive in doing them and I love doing them. And then um, since about March, when the lockdown began, I started running about seven days a week. Um, I was running about 60 plus miles a week, um, as well as adding in biking and swimming during the summer months. Um, and due to my high endurance, my triathlon times this past year were excellent. Um, just because I had so much endurance and I was able to keep um, just putting out mileage and going for long distances. Um, but as I get older, I'm, a, I'm 39 and I'm starting to find value in rest and recovery. And I just don't know how to do that with um, other triathlon training I'm doing and running and gaining this, um, wanting to gain strength, strength over the off season. Okay. Good question. So Becky, what you can do is you can actually put a barbell on your back when you're doing all these exercises. <laughs> yeah. You just, no. she made me exhausted going, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm totally joking. Okay. I'm going to ask you a few questions that help me, help me out with advising you. Okay. So if you were to, if you were to rank your endurance training in terms of like how much you value it and how much you enjoy it on a scale of one to 10, where would it be? Well, she'll say 10. A 10. Okay. Yeah. Now, if, and you got to be honest, uh, strength training, uh, how much do you value it in terms of while you're doing it, enjoying it and love it on a scale of one to 10? I started out as one. Okay. Um, I'm currently probably at an, uh, as in, as far as liking it, I'm at a six, but seeing the results I get when I do it, I'm at like an eight to nine. Okay. How many days a week do you, do you want to exercise? Um, Seven. Okay. So you like to work out seven days a week. All right. I, I'm, I'm going to have you one day a week do resistance training. That's it. You're, you're okay. going to get the strength from it. It'll help protect you. The rest of the days you could do what you enjoy. I mean, and this is what's really important, Becky, is that you know, we don't want to get stuck in the, I want everything because that's impossible. You have to be honest and say, well, I enjoy this the most. And what I like about, this is what I think I hear from you. What I like about resistance training is how it makes my body feel, the strength, you know, the muscle while I do it, I don't enjoy it nearly as much, but I like some of the benefits. Well, you're going to get some of the benefits with one day a week of resistance training well, on the other days. You could do the other stuff. I would definitely throw in a mobility day though. I would mm. definitely do one of the endurance days. Just focus on mobility. Are we not? So I was a little confused here. So we, are we not trying to transition out of all this running and some of that? Are we, are I really like the muscle that I'm building and I feel more confident and I can feel, um, I have strength path, strength trained, um, in the like the more the winter months when I'm inside, um, I try to get in two days a week of that. But I could also see that really helped my endurance this summer as far as like the biking and the swimming. My swimming time improved and my biking time. And the only thing I did was add in um, just a little bit more um, resistance training over the winter. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I guess what I'm asking is that uh, are are we trying to get get rid of all the the running and marathons? Are we that's something yeah, you? But just how to, to try to it, balance right? in this off season when it's cold. I'm in Minnesota, so it's cold during the winter. Mm -hmm. I run early in the morning or later at night. It's cold, and it's just sometimes it'd be nice to just stay in the house and lift weights versus you know um, 
logging all the miles okay, and just building well, that strength over the winter months. I mean, you, she could do like a hybrid approach to this, right? We had, we had mm-hmm. a question not that long ago where we talked to somebody kind of similar and we were telling them that, you know, I, yes, I agree uh, one day a week with Sal is saying, but let's say it's a week where it's so cold, you don't go out and run and do any of your cardio all week long. And then that week you could train two or three days in there, but you have to adjust the strength training based off of how much cardio endurance type of training that you're doing or else you're just, you're going to do too much and then it's just it's counterproductive so you have to be able to go okay this is a week where i'm probably not going to get out and run very much therefore i can strength train full body two to three times a week if it's a week when you're getting out and you're getting these runs in then i'm with sal i would tell you just to do the one day a week but uh, you know, people like yourself who obviously have a competitive streak and very disciplined. The mistake I think they make uh, when they when they start to see some of the benefits from strength training is they try and do all of it. Mm-hmm. They try and be this super super athlete as far as endurance sports, and then they also want to get really strong. And they think that the more that they strength train, in addition to all this running they're doing, that the stronger they're going to get. And there'll be a tipping point. There'll be a point where the body says, "Nah, you're just asking too much of it." And so you have to learn how to balance the two of them and what that looks like is some weeks you're going to be one day a week of strength training and then maybe other weeks when you completely scale back on all the endurance training and it's cold and you don't want to get out and do that and you want to be inside and lift then you could do two or three days but I would never go beyond three days of lifting and I would always be between that one to three and I would let my endurance training dictate how much strength training yeah, you want to bolster your endurance training and, and reinforce your joints one thing I would recommend um, and I, I do love that you're considering strength training. However, I also want you to consider, you know, moving in different planes and being able to, uh, you know, do things in the frontal plane, the transverse plane. So you're twisting, you're also moving laterally. Uh, and, and this is going to be really important because of all the repetitive stress of, of you doing the same uh, type of movements going forward in the sagittal plane constantly. Uh, you know, this will help to kind of build more longevity support structure around the joints, you know, avoid, you know, chronic issues in terms of pain and, uh, and, and weaknesses later on. So, you know, to incorporate that in your strength training, I highly suggest. Yeah. Becky, I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines a little bit and I've trained a lot of people like you. And, um, in my experience, it's not going to happen until you start to enjoy it. That's why I'm saying once a week, I I think once a week is realistic. And here's what I think is going to happen. If you do it right, and you don't overtrain, you'll eventually want to do more because you'll really start to enjoy that aspect of it. But f- forcing yourself to do more of it just because you like the results, but you hate doing it and you love running so much, right. that tends to be a failing strategy. It tends to be right. like, a, oh, on again, off again type of strategy. You love running so much, so then I would say Not fine. to mention the body's not going to respond the way you want. If you're, if you're running... That's what I was wondering too, is with all my endurance training, I feel like maybe if I backed off that a little bit and strength trained more, I'd see more. Of course. You 100%. Of course. And that's what I mean by you, you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to listen to Sal only do one day a week because you, you love your running and you're doing that. But then if there's a week or two where you say, you know what, the next two weeks, I'm really going to scale back. I don't have any competitions coming up for a while and I'm just going to focus on strength training. Nothing wrong with you going to two to three days a week, but I, I, I also wouldn't do this. I wouldn't go one day a week strength training, all of a sudden you back off all your endurance training, then all of a sudden you go seven days of strength training. That's kind of the your personality would probably naturally gravitate to that. Uh, and and you need to not do that. You don't want to do that. You're always looking to do the least amount of work to elicit the most amount of change. So for you, it's one day a week. And then if all of a sudden you decide to scale way back on the endurance training, then sure, give yourself two times a week, maybe three max, following like yeah. a MAPS anabolic the, protocol. Just objectively, Becky, the, the most success I ever had with the triathletes and marathon runners that I trained, and these are people that that's what they want to do. They want to do well in triathlons. They want to do well in marathons. They've trained a couple Ironman competitors. That's the priority. And we use resistance training as a way to support that. And it was once a week. We didn't do more than once a week. I would have them do mobility stuff and that would happen, you know, either before or after their runs or their swims or, you know, when they would ride. But once a week of resistance training was the best. I've tried two, three, and with the amount of training that they were doing for their sport, it was just, it was just too much. They would have had to back way off on their triathlon training in order to do more resistance training, but then they would have lost performance in their particular sport. So this is the trade-off. Yeah. That's why I'm saying- We'll also consider an off-season, 
right? Like, it, right, because that's what we're going into now. It's pretty much the off season. Yeah, so consider the off season as the way to reinforce and strengthen your body, and you can you can back off the volume of running and the endurance side of it to to really hyper focus on, you know, bolstering your body, strengthening your body, building support around your joints, and then come back into the season. Every athlete needs an off season to rebuild their body. So, yeah, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. Inevitably, you're going to run into problems. Yeah, we're going to do you have maps performance because I feel like that's that would be the best kind of resistance training program for what you're doing? I do not. So. Okay, we'll send that to you. Now it has three foundational workouts a week in there. Pick one. Pick one of them. And then the mobility sessions, I suggest you do those a few days a week. They're short. You can do it for 15 minutes. Um, maybe as a warm-up or a primer before your, your endurance training. And I think you'll be good. I really think unless you cut your running and your cardio down, your endurance training down, more than one day a week of resistance training. I, I'm look. I'll tell you what. I'm gonna bet that you're probably already a little overtraining. So well, I, I do. Um, yeah. Well, I do resistance training three days a week. I run four, and then I do spin twice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're way overtrained, Becky. Yeah. <laughs> you could definitely take a beating. I think you've proven that. But yeah, well, that, and that's cutting back. I've cut my mileage in half since um, the summer. Becky, you're a certified badass. That's what you are. So it's <laughs> yeah. it's tough when you're that badass to kind of scale back. Don't and just don't be, let the badass turn you into a dumbass yeah, yeah. though. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> <It is>. Okay. <laughs> so being ass. Miles, yeah. Just, yeah. 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 All but right. you're getting up there in age with us, so uh, you definitely yeah, need Yeah, I know. Happy 40th, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You know, you know what's funny? The, yeah. the people that do this the most yeah. are the late 30s, early 40s clients. I don't know what it is. I think it's that like, uh, I don't know. It's just like the clients yeah. that I had that would constantly overdo it or like in that age This group. is starting to really yeah. inspire me to, uh, to write a program. I feel like we get this so much right now. And what what I what I find us consistently advising, and it's funny, right? We're bouncing between. I where I see um, flow sessions from Hit being amazing. I see mobility sessions from Performance being amazing, and then I see foundational days either from Anabolic or Performance. So if we could build some sort of a hybrid for people that do cardio first, yeah, like it'd yeah. be like the Maps Cardio program. Like so, if cardio is your your endurance training is your your yep. first love. How do I blend strength training? And we write some sort of a program that yeah. actually, I mean, if we get enough people that reach out after hearing this, uh, maybe we'll do something like that. Because I feel like we answer a lot of questions around this and giving people a, a more structured guidance on how we would do that, I think would be helpful. Yeah. It's it's so, it's like, I, I used to do this. I used to do this in my workouts. I, I would look at my workouts and be like, you know what? I want more strength endurance. So rather than changing my workout, I would just add it. To what I was currently doing. Oh, totally. And I would just add, and, oh, the sled is good. Throw it on top. Oh, plyo is good. Throw it on top. And it, your body, it doesn't work that yeah, way. You it's just back off. It's just way too much. And I used to love getting clients like this because I would, I'd be an asshole and I'd get them to cut way back. Yeah. And then I, it would be wonderful because they'd come back and be like, I'm faster. Mm -hmm. I'm strong. What the hell's going on? I'm like, well, I told you. Yeah, no, as a trainer, you always would rather have somebody you got to pull the reins. I mean, that's just like, that's in life, right? As employees, I'd rather have the two. I'd rather have somebody I have to pull the reins back than the, somebody have to kick in than the, the guy or the girl. I got to constantly be motivating every day because yeah. that gets exhausting as a coach is trying to inspire them every day to get up and go do their session. They're the, they're just the heart. They're type A. They're type A personality and they think more means more results and it just, it doesn't work that way. So mm -hmm. I totally get it, but, uh, I feel like we're getting a lot of these questions of people that have endurance Super sports, common. but then also want to build muscle. And what does that look like? Our next caller is Amanda from Washington. Hi, Amanda. How can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, I have kind of an interesting story, I feel like. Um, about six weeks ago, I came back from a six-week-long um, training with the Army, and I lost um, a good amount of weight with that. Um, probably 10 pounds, and I started out at 134, um, so 10 pounds less than that, and uh, I didn't actually get to finish the training, so I want to go back. I have unfinished business, but because of that weight loss, when I try again, I want to have a lot more weight, mostly muscle, and I don't care if some of it's fat, too. I just need to make sure I can still keep my run time up for this training and then um, just maybe gain some more stability um, and durability. Because uh, another thing I noticed with this training was my knees got quite inflamed. Um, we did a lot of kneeling with our rucksacks on and 
I've been doing uh, MAPS performance and I've been back for six weeks and I could just now do walking lunges again to touch my knee to the floor. So um, it's been a long road <laughs> of I'm trying to heal up. Mm. But um, like I said, I want to try again. I'm pretty committed to it, but um, I want to see what you guys have to say for making it a little safer. Okay. So, so you want to, you want to get a good runtime and you want to continue to build muscle. What's the runtime specifically? Like, what are you looking to maintain? Um, so right now it's, my run isn't a problem. Um, I need to do a 40 minute five miler. So it's just eight minutes a mile. Okay. And that's, fairly easy for me right now. I could do a 37 minute just even if I was sick. So oh, cool. just that up. Okay. So you want to keep, you want to be able to maintain under 40 minute, five mile run, but you also want to build uh, muscle and strength. Yeah. Okay. You could, okay. You could probably maintain that with, by doing that particular run twice a week. Yeah, so twice a, a week, once or twice, you know, twice a week I would do the five mile run. And then twice a week I would do, or maybe three days, but probably twice I would do heavy lifting and I would increase calories, make sure your protein intake is really high. And that should be the right recipe. I don't think you're going to lose your, your run time if you maintain those two days a week. And, and that leaves enough room for you to do a resistance training program that'll help you build muscle. I think performance is perfect. You mentioned yeah. knee inflammation. You got to maintain some of that agility and that mobility. You will build muscle on mass performance. It is not a. Uh, it is definitely a muscle building program. It's just muscle building in a functional way, and I think that's what you need. So I'd stay on mass performance and then try what I said. I think you could even do. Uh, I think you could, if I were to do the running, I would go uh, three days a week, but it would look like this: one mile on one day. That's it. So just one mile fast, which is take you seven minutes to eight minutes. Another day in there, it would be half. The, the total the the total uh, mileage and then the one, only one day a week would it be full so you're not running that much uh, and then what Sal said with maps performance in conjunction with those I you should be able to keep your time solid on that uh, and then most of the programming is focused around building muscle and it would I would toggle you back and forth between two days a week and three days a week completely based off of how you're feeling so if you're feeling great and body's responding and we don't have any sort of achiness. Uh, I'd let you train three days a week. If a week came through and you're like, ah, oh, I'm really tight, I'm stiff, I'd scale you back to two, but then I would put emphasis on the mobility sessions on those days, and that's where we'd spend more of our time. Okay. Um, with the knee inflammation, would you guys recommend trying, like, stepping back, doing some more, like, weighted lunges and trying to, like, increase the strength in my knees, or would that... Um, like, well, well, what do you so think the, is aggravating yeah. them right now? I, I think like assessing that would, would help a lot. Like, uh, you know, with our prime uh, program, I know we have a couple of different tests to kind of work your way through that, whether it's, you know, a tracking issue, whether it's an ankle or a hip, you know, derived issue. It, it sounds like it might be from it, you getting on your knees. Was it, the, was, was yeah. it the, is it the kneeling, the running or the exercise, like the knee over the toe uh, kind of. Yeah, it was kneeling with a 70 pound rucksack. So that's what so I don't know if that's like something you just get used to, or yeah, if it's yeah, like, all right, yeah. that's just going to suck for okay. a while. Yeah, there's nothing, I mean, there's there's not much you can do um, to, to prevent that aside from working on strength and mobility in your ankles and hips. That might help with how you kneel. Mm -hmm. But okay. it sounds like the inflammation is from the actual pressure of the floor. Yeah, I believe knees. so. <laughs> yeah, so okay. and that's a little different, right? That's going to be it's that's that means you know stop doing that, I guess, <laughs> to help with the inflammation. But <laughs> right. if that's what you're required to do, um, then yeah. I would still work on mobility because the less tightness you have overall, probably the less painful it'll be. Well, to kneel down. There, no, there's some there's some some good points to that, right? I mean, the the more mobile you're going to be in your hips and ankles, the more you can rely on actually the muscles supporting, and so you're not actually just letting the resting all your weight on the joint. Right. So maybe what happens right now when you get down on the knee, you like completely are at rest and you let your your all your weight go straight to the patella where maybe if you have good ankle mobility, good hip mobility, and good strength in your lower body, you keep a little you keep your muscles tense in that position well, so they is, alleviate a little bit of the pressure. This is where I'd incorporate something like a Turkish get up as well. So you can kind of get up and down off your knee. Uh, from the floor uh, weighted so really try to like work on the skill of that and uh, be able to uh, activate your muscles properly to help support your joints in that position 
Oh, that's great. And, awesome. Am, am I reading this correctly? Are you are you uh, trying to become an army ranger? Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Well, it's a little different going to the ranger leadership course versus going through assessment and selection. Um, so this is anything um, or the army's premier leadership course. You get a tab. Um, so I would have something on my uniform, but um, I wouldn't be a forward operator shooting bad guys. Wow. <laughs> still, still, still awesome. Yeah, this is like, I think uh, there's a theme to today, right? Woman badass day. Yeah. We've, yeah. we've had quite a few of you guys today. Yeah, That's seriously. awesome. I'm trying to be, trying yeah. to be. <laughs> I think well, I know. Okay, so you said you have Maps Performance. Uh, Justin brought up Maps Prime. Do you have Maps Prime? Because if not, we'll send I that have, over to you. I have Performance and Prime. Yeah. All right, you're, uh, you're set then. Like smart, I, smart one. Myself then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're 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 set then, Amanda. Just just do those things. I think you'll be okay. Good. And I want to thank Adam too. His push up video on YouTube. I started out doing my perfect push ups and only being able to do three. And by the time a year later, um, after working on the uh, suggestions that he made, I got fifty two perfect push ups on wow. my PT. Wow, that's Boo. that's wow. 50, that's fifty more push ups than Adam could do. <laughs> <laughs> Mark yeah. that right. up there. Yeah, That's uh, the Adam seventeen Sal four. So we're doing good here. Oh, so. just made, awesome. You just made that up. You made up the score. <laughs> Thanks for thank calling, you, man. Amanda. Yeah, thank you guys. No so problem. Much. You know, uh, note here when you're what it takes to maintain a certain level of performance is a lot less than what it takes to get. Right. So if you're already you know, like in this example when we were talking to Amanda, she can already run a sub forty minute five miles. Right. She said thirty seven minutes easy when she's sick. You don't need a lot to maintain that, right? That's Same thing with strength. That's why yeah. I thought only even one day of doing the full run yeah. and then half of the run on another day and then only a one mile the other day. So you're talking about seven minutes on one day. She yeah. actually sprints, uh, what, another 14 to 20-something minutes on yeah. another day. And then only one day is she hitting that 35, 40 right. minutes. Just and, to maintain the skill. And she'll actually probably see she might imp Im improve a little bit. Uh, from that so i easily maintain that and then with two or three days of strength training she should be able to put on some good muscle our next caller is will from tennessee hey what's up will how can we help up, you will hey fellas how are you good man. good man uh i'd like to say thank you i appreciate uh what you do your uh platform your information is amazing um i actually got uh hooked on your podcast uh well, you were on the order of man podcast and and uh that's where i kind of got on to you awesome. but uh um, anyways, just had to give a shout out to, to Ryan Mickler over there. Um, Great guy. Yeah. my question is, uh, really my goals, I've got a five-year-old son. I want to be, um, as strong and as agile for him as possible. Uh, I've been listening to you. I've got a three day a week, full body routine going, um, pretty consistent. Haven't worked in any trigger sessions yet. Um, at the moment I'm, I'm building a deadlift platform, um, for my, for my home and, I guess my question to you is, is there any benefit in making it possible to do deficit deadlifts on that platform? Yeah, there, there's, you know, there's, there's some good value in deficit deadlifts, especially if your sticking point is at the bottom of a deadlift. Now, one caveat is you need to have the, re the mobility mm -hmm. and the technique to do it because if you're tight – and your ankle mobility isn't that great, or you start to round your back just to be able to go down low enough to do a deficit deadlift, you're, you're increasing your risk of injury quite a bit. There's also another way of doing these. So one way is to stand on a platform. It allows you to still use the 45, especially if you're real strong, you can still stack the 45s on your side. If you're not lifting more than you know a couple hundred pounds on a deficit deadlift, you could also just put 35s on it or 25s, and now it's just lower to the floor and you don't need to stand um, on anything in order to elevate yourself. But if you're using the big plates, obviously, you know, you don't want to put, you know, f you can't fit 15, 25s on each side. Then I would, I would use a platform. And the way that I would program it is I would do my, you know, my normal workouts. And if you have the prerequisite mo mo uh, mobility, then one workout, I would focus on deficit deads. And then maybe at the end of the workout, I would do a couple sets of traditional, you know, off the floor type deadlifts. To be clear, though, I mean, based off of what you kind of said real quick, and I don't, know, I don't know how deep we can get into your goals, but I mean, if if it's more about being a dad and and being strong and being mobile, um, you're not missing a tremendous if you're not. I mean, you could do without them, right? Yeah, exactly. In fact, I I would love to see you doing like a, a maps performance type of program. I mean, 
very, it sounds like your goals are really similar to kind of where my goals are in my life right now. I really don't care about being the buffest dude right now or getting on stage or anything crazy like that. Um, I really want to be able to keep up with my son. I want to be strong. I want to be able to get down and squat in the squatted position and play with him and not feel like my back's on fire or my knees are killing me. And uh, so if if you align with that, then actually like a, a MAPS performance type of program where you got good strength training, foundational days, three days a week, and then you're working on a lot of your mobility, um, I think you'll get the, the biggest bang from your body. And that doesn't mean that you I wouldn't have you also deadlift and then follow like an anabolic program, but I think... Well, we put deadlifts in performance too, especially yeah. in phase one. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's in there. And I do think there's value in deficit deadlifts, but just... You know, use it as like a completely different exercise. So this is something like you want to reduce the weight substantially until you feel like you really have control over yeah. that at the bottom part because and, and two, this is going to help with those functional goals as well because you are going to be in positions where you're bending over substantially and, you know, it's going to help to give you like strength where you need it uh, in compromising type positions, which is ideal. Uh, but to Adam's point, you know, in terms of like a lot of more different uh, relatable, translatable kind of functional moves, like you're going to get that in performance, uh, you know, a, a bit more. Yeah. You, you know, Will, I, I, I know there's a lot of like uh, specific strength athletes, like power lifters that really, they relatively regularly program deficit deadlifts into their, their programs. And remember these are power lifters and the goal is to, get as strong as possible in three uh, lifts. Now, if you're just looking for overall strength and muscle um, and balance, because powerlifting can be sometimes, oftentimes a very unbalanced sport. It's all in you know one plane, right? Um, then, you know, deficit deads, like I, I'll personally, I do deficit deadlifts, you know, maybe a few times a year. And to give you an idea of how much weight I'll use on it, if I'm doing singles with 500 or 520 pounds, I'm not going above 300 pounds mm -hmm. on a deficit dead. So what Justin said is 100% accurate. It's, it's you're, you're, you're treating it like range of motion, staying connected, not necessarily like your deadlift where you're, you're pushing the weight. Very similar to if your goal is to get more depth in your squat. Right. And, and I think that's a that's a valuable goal to have uh, because it does set you up for success when you're in those types of positions to generate force and strength, you know, in, in some of those more difficult positions. So uh, I find value in deficit deadlift. I find value in, you know, really getting depth in your squat. Just make sure you're really you know treating them uh, with respect and, 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 you know, lightening the load substantially. Yeah. The, the key really is to, to, to take care of all the prerequisites first before you do that, not the other way around. Right. So I, that's a great uh, example. Justin is it, mm -hmm. it's just like the pursuit of getting a deeper squat but the way like I got a deeper squat was working on my ankle, ankle and hip mobility, mobility first right. and then I would cha that challenge my range of motion with lighter weight okay good I'm getting a little bit deeper in my squat go back a lot of focus on mobility test it again on deeper squat that's kind of how I would handle these deficit deads is I would apply the mobility work that we have in performance Every once in a while on your deadlift day, decide to do them light and on deficit dead to see how your form is and how it feels mm -hmm. and to keep challenging it like that and use it use it more as a gauge of am I getting better range of motion in my deadlifts than it is like, you know, trying to really do it like you see the power lifter is doing it. You have totally different goals. And I'm I'm with Sal. I mean, I haven't done deficit deadlifts in probably three or four years. So and I when I was doing it, it was purely because I just I was trying to get a stronger deadlift. I wanted to get my numbers up. Um, I had different goals back then. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. If if you don't have mass performance, by the way, we'll send that over to you, Will. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. No problem. Thanks for listening to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, fellas. I appreciate your input and your honesty, and uh, love what you're doing. Thank you. You awesome. got it. Cool. Thanks, Will. Yeah, I think this highlights something important about advanced. Uh, variations in lifts or advanced techniques like bands and chains and partial reps and negatives and mm -hmm. deficit lifts and floor presses and all valuable. Okay, I want to be very clear. All valuable, all could provide value, improve your, str your strength and mobility, but the, they're not the bread and butter. They really are not the bread and butter. And many of them require lots of preparation before you go and attempt them. And I, I've seen way too many times somebody go and, for example, try to do deficit deadlifts and I watch their form. Back is rounding. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, you, yeah. not only is that not good technique, but you probably should be practicing with no weight 
because that four inch difference it doesn't seem like much, but it is, especially if you always train in one particular range of motion. I think I think where this happens, or where people like why this becomes a, a good question, or why we get asked this question, is you you are wanting to get stronger in your deadlift and you come across someone's page. Some and of these the, videos inspires. Yeah, totally. and exactly. And they're touting how totally. great de deficit deadlifts. And you're like, oh, well, I want to get good at deadlifts. And so, and if this has helped this person mm -hmm. out and they're qualified, smart, whatever, or really strong, uh, should I do it? And it's like, you know, you can get a really strong deadlift and do other things that are more valuable to your specific goals uh, without having to do that too. I right. think that's the, the misconception is that, Oh, well, I should do that too. Well, it really depends. And if he was a client of mine, I'd really want to dive into like his goals. Like when he mentioned that about his son and like, okay, you want to get stronger in your deadlift. We can work on that. No mm -hmm. problem. And we can never do deficit deads and be fine with that. You also want to be mobile and you want to be able to play with your son. That's another major goal of yours. Okay. Well, let's work on mobility and that be the primary focus. Yeah. We'll get stronger in your deadlift. Along the way, we'll also get to a place where you mm -hmm. comfortably can do deficit deadlifts. I, I really like what Justin said about treating it like a new exercise. If you train in this 12-inch range of motion and that's how you constantly get stronger and stronger and stronger, there's some carryover to outside of that range of motion. But it, but the more you move outside that range of motion, the faster it diminishes to the point where a lot of that strength means almost noth nothing. Yeah. In fact- Unfamiliar territory. In fact, I'll tell you what, I've trained a lot of runners who have decent stability and stamina right in that running range of motion. You bring them below that and they completely fall apart because they never train in that range of motion. This will happen to you too when you resistance train. If you train at and you squat to parallel and you've built up a really good squat and you've moved up to 400 pounds or whatever and you're doing great and then you think, you know what? I'm gonna try going four inches lower. Mm -hmm. So let me lighten the load. Let me go 50 pounds down from my normal weight because 50 pounds is a lot. Not nearly enough of a cut in weight. Uh, no mm -hmm. joke. I would go down you know, 70% and focus on connecting because the risk of injury goes up so much because you are now training in a range of motion that you really never train in. Yeah, and, and to make sure you have that range of motion and go through the mobility of that first, obviously, is a prerequisite. It's important. I would even like probably prioritize unilateral training before I would even Good go point. into the deficit deadlift. Oh, so yeah. if he was to focus Single more on that- Single leg deadlift off the floor. Right, because I mean, most of the issues of strength is, is instability. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to, to be able to kind of reinforce that by adding just like unilateral focus, I think would go much further. I 100% agree. And that's what I I mean, I feel like there's a, a for his goals, what there's he's really way, There's to, other stuff that's There's many important. things that yeah. he could be doing that he, not only will he get good at his desired outcome of increasing his deadlift strength and, and mobility that are going to benefit him a lot more than just doing de deficit deads. Totally. Look, if you like our information, you're going to love mindpumpfree.com. We have lots of free content, free guides written specifically for our audience that'll help you with almost any fitness goal. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. Uh, I'm at mindpumpsal, and Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam.